Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Brookings. What a treat to see you all in this auditorium. Thanks for coming out on this beautiful spring day. I'm Mike O'Hanlon, and along with my colleague Vonda Felbad Brown, we run the Africa Security Initiative, and we're very pleased today to convene an event with your participation as well as the audience that's watching virtually and remotely on the Horn of Africa. And a region that, of course, is extraordinarily important, uh, has some of the largest and most consequential countries in Africa, also some of the countries with the greatest promise, but also the greatest difficulty. And often in a single country, you may have both promise and peril at the same time. And I'm thinking there, perhaps, first and foremost of Ethiopia, uh, but hardly the only one. Just for definitional purposes and before I introduce uh, our distinguished guests and then will our featured panelists and then hand the baton to Vonda who will conduct the main conversation for the first hour of our session after which we look forward to your uh, your questions as well as virtual questions but just to frame what we're talking about today we are thinking of the Horn of Africa both in a broader and a more restrictive sense the broader concept might be thought of as eight countries that also include not only Somalia Ethiopia and both Sudan's but also Djibouti, Eritrea, Kenya, and Uganda, which is how the African Union <clears throat> thinks about this in the definition of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, which is uh, where our distinguished guest, uh, hailing from the great nation of Ethiopia, of his nation of origin, and Djibouti, his, uh, and I will introduce Dr. Workney in just a second, uh, with a little bit more of a full uh, preparation and, and uh, the introduction that he deserves. Uh, but that's where he's based, and that's the region that he covers. Jeffrey Feltman uh, took a little bit more of a specific definition in most of his travails and efforts in the Horn of Africa, focusing largely on Ethiopia and Sudan. But of course, this inner region of the Horn is often also defined as including the other Sudan, South Sudan and Somalia. I just wanted to frame that for you. And, and Vonda, of course, with her questions and conversation, will, will hone in on different <coughs> dynamics, different relationships, and different countries within that broad block. As I wrap up here, let me now say a couple of words about each of our uh, panelists. Actually, let me start with Jeffrey Feltman, because he is part of the team here at Brookings. But for much of the last year, he was also President Biden's envoy for the Horn of Africa, trying to address a number of the challenges that we'll get into in conversation, including the civil conflict within Ethiopia, which until recently had been one of Africa's great countries of promise and hopefully will return to that status. And those are my words, not anybody else's on the panel, but uh, that's how I see it from my amateur 30,000 foot perspective. Uh, but also, of course, ongoing challenges with uh, threat, threats to civilian rule in Sudan, with ongoing civil conflict in South Sudan, and with ongoing anarchy uh, of various sorts uh, and flavors in Somalia. So it's a region that has a lot of different characteristics, a lot of different problems, but still a sense of regional connectedness in terms of diplomacy, in terms of economics, in terms of some of the conflicts spilling over borders or being fueled by interstate dynamics, uh, but also one hopes in terms of opportunity and promise for the future. Our distinguished guest, Dr. Awurkne Agebeyehu, is a Ethiopian by origin. He has served as Ethiopia's foreign minister, as well as its minister of transport. He hails from the region of Oramia, uh, but has also, of course, obviously worked on behalf of the entire country and uh, has distinguished himself during this period when I think Ethiopia was showing such remarkable promise throughout much of the 2010s with growth rates in GDP often approaching 10% a year, really one of the great success stories and hopeful stories of Africa. And we, again, we hope that uh, he will return or his country will return to that kind of trajectory soon. But his responsibilities now are region wide and on behalf of the IGAD of the African Union. And so it's really, doctor, a great privilege to have you here. I should say that um, his education uh, includes a PhD in criminology from South Africa. Jeffrey Feltman's background includes uh, hailing from the great Buckeye State and, and going to school at Ball State, winding up at Tufts University, but then spending a quarter century in the United States Foreign Service, ultimately Hillary Clinton's Assistant Secretary <coughs> of State for the Middle East, and then for six years, the Under Secretary for Political Affairs at the United Nations. We've been pleased to have him as a colleague here at Brookings now for about four years, with the partial exception of that leave of absence to be the special envoy just recently. So uh, thank you for indulging me as I tried to frame the discussion and introduce the panelists. But before I hand the baton to Vonda, maybe we could have a round of applause for our distinguished guest, Dr. Workman. Thank you. 
and Dr. Felton. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Ambassador Feldman, it's terrific to have you back with us uh, to be able to have this conversation. Um, Your Excellency, let me start with a few questions to you about Somalia. Uh, We have uh, just gone through the very important presidential elections in the country that put a cap on a year of an acute political crisis uh, between um, the former president, uh, Muhammad and his political rivals, a, a acute political crisis that at various times last year threatened to tip Somalia into a civil war. But on Sunday, we have closed uh, both the long overdue election and the complex process of indirect selection, election of um, ultimately Hassan Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, as uh, president. Mr. Uh, Mohamud is returning to the presidency. He was president of Somalia from 2012 to 2017. And what we have seen uh, in the process of the elections are the continuing complex dynamics between the Hawi and Darod and the subclans like Maharan, between uh, political leadership contestation, uh, between the diaspora and non-diaspora members uh, of uh, leadership in Somalia and a whole set of deep unresolved issues that continue today uh, regarding uh, the distribution of power, armed forces, resources between dominant and minority clans, between the federal government in Mohagadishu and um, federal member states. Uh, What is your reflection on the election and what are the key issues that um, President Mohammed will need to be tackling uh, very rapidly as he takes uh, on the burden of leadership in Somalia again. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of us. Good afternoon. <coughs> uh, I'm very happy to be asked this very important question. It is very uh, fresh to our mind. Uh, and also, the, in fact, the issue of Somalia is... Uh, uh, an issue for a long time for um, any diplomat or for international security experts or the governments. As IGAD Executive Secretary, uh, <coughs> I can say this. Uh, <coughs> for us, uh, the past six, seven months which after the Somalis start to compete for the election was very volatile situation in the country within and from outside. Number one, <clears throat> there was a furious competition, uh, which you said it in terms of clan or whatever it is. Uh, there is also a furious competition within the government of the President Formaggio as well. That sometimes leads lead us to not only political challenge, but also it leads to a security challenge, which we, from the outside, that always Al-Shabaab is waiting to exploit it. So uh, <clears throat> the recent event, we were monitoring. We were working with the government, with the institutions, with civil societies, as well as with the international organizations on this issue. So we were very curious about the process of the election. Having in mind Somalia once a collapsed state, all the fragility is there, security threat is there. Al Shabaab still can uh, take any action in the center of Somalia, including near to Villa Somalia, with all these challenges. Somalia, Somali, the Somali leadership convened their process of uh, selecting, electing their president. So uh, the outcome was not for all of the practitioners, for the analysts, for the politicians. It was not the expected result in terms of a person who is the president now. Who is. But in terms of the process, in terms of all the experiences and the peacefulness of the, that, that process is a big encouragement for our region. And also we were saying that Somalia was at the crossroad of history, whether to go back to the collapse it was before or to go to to the next stage, which is going to be the election which is going to be conducted by the people of Somalia. So 
it is one of a good news which we hear from the Horn of Africa uh, in terms of uh, the reason. And also uh, the response from the international community was also very commanding. Everybody was congratulating the leadership. And also uh, it is good to remind that in some African countries, it may be difficult to unseat the, the incumbent president with this kind of election. So that happened in Somalia. So it's really a very positive development that should be consolidated in terms of peace and security and institutional building. Thank you very much. You mentioned um, Shabab and insecurity. And as uh, Somalia was going through the complex process of changing the presidency and electing or selecting um, a new parliament as well, there has been another shift underway. And that is away from the African Union AMISOM mission that for the past (coughs) decade was um, critical for um, um, preventing further expansion of um, al-Shabaab to a new mission. And one of the reasons why this transition was taking place, uh, African Union uh, uh, team that is called ATMIS, the African Union uh, transition mission in Somalia, was because there was a sense among donors, international partners, as well as many Somalis, that the security situation was steadily deteriorating, that Shabab's reach became bigger and bigger. You mentioned close to Villa Somalia uh, in various parts of the country. And uh, meanwhile, AMISO mission was repeatedly extended, was expiring uh, in December, yet offensive operations were not taking place. And the objective of handing uh, security functions, uh, offensive and defensive, to uh, Somali forces like the Somali National Army has been elusive. The Somali National Army still suffers from critical uh, problems uh, running the entire gamut from force generation to um, logistics to conducting even very basic um, defensive operations. Now we are with the new mission ATMIS that's supposed to last until 2024. Uh, by which time it's supposed to go down to zero from maybe 20,000 and um, uh, hand power over uh, and security responsibility over to um, Somali national forces. What are some of the key elements that need to take place so that we don't end up with ATMIS with the same problems that we had with AMISOM? The inability to hand over to anyone uh, stalemated, deteriorating battlefield, increasing power of Shabab, and frankly, a sense last fall that if Amisom was simply withdrawn as it was supposed to end, we would see Somalia falling to al-Shabab in the same way that Afghanistan fell to the Taliban. Yeah, now, as I said earlier, definitely uh, now also the most important actors in, in Somalian political process as well as security apparatus and also for the future, uh, the most important actors should be the people of Somalia. Uh, previously, you know, I have to commend uh, the, the politicians with all the difficulties, the challenges that were happened in Somalia. Finally, they agreed to make these kind of things. And finally, all of them congratulated the president that, mm-hmm. uh, who is now elected president or selected president. So that should be a political wisdom uh, uh, in, in, in all measurements in, in, in Africa. So in terms of security, uh, still now for the next president, elected president will be the major challenge is going to be security. Not only security, the drought, the drought situation in the region is one of the daring situation which millions of the uh, people in the region are facing food insecurity, and some of them are in starvation. Uh, in terms of atmos or uh, the, the, the peacekeeping element in the region, the challenge that we were facing, even if in some region of the, con- the, the country, uh, Amisom was not popular, but generally Am- Amisom and the, the new one, Asam, is also is in charge of the peace and security. Even this election was conducted under the patronage of this uh, peacekeeping forces. So it's a very important force, which no one has replaced that force till now in terms of keeping peace and security in the region. Uh, but 
Thus, when we are going to <coughs> give the chance to strong the institutions of Somalia, ultimately the Somali institutions are going to be in charge of their own country. Uh, and also now we are facing the issue of budget as well as the issue to which European Union is paying more than 90% of the, 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 the budget of uh, this force. So now we are going to enter to the competition of uh, resource, resource because you know that the world is now uh, the issue of Ukraine is there and a lot of, a lot of resource competition which may hamper uh, effectively helping the Somali institutions to take over the security by themselves. So still, this peacekeeping force is very important. Still, the security situation will remain under this force, but slowly but surely, or the United, United Nations Security Council has uh, decided this is going to be until 2024. So until 2024, what we are going to do on the institution, security institution of Somalia is the most important question, I think, if I got your, your question. Um, indeed. Um, and, and I would just uh, sort of add here that, of course, part of the problems of generating to Somali national forces has been uh, often a tension between Mogadishu and federal member states as they have been forming. And a sense that the Somali National Army, <coughs> mostly a conglomeration of clan-based militias, is often as much of a threat to states, uh, to federal member states, uh, as it is a benefit in countering um, um, al-Shabaab. So one of the issues that um, President Mohamud will um, be facing it is how to assure states that uh, uh, the security forces generated at the national level are to their benefit and not a threat to them. I, I am very glad that you mentioned the horrific situation with respect to the drought. And just to get our um, viewership some sense of, of numbers of the uh, real challenge and potential catastrophe we are talking about, as it is right now, we have uh, maybe 1.4 million malnourished children uh, in Somalia. 70% of them are not going to school because of the drought. Uh, 700,000 people have been displaced in Somalia because of the drought and are moving to new areas looking for uh, basic uh, food, basic uh, water. In 2011, uh, when we had uh, another drought, uh, 260,000 people died. Uh, and uh, more than half of them were kids under the age of six. Uh, what needs to be done now uh, so we do not avoid, uh, so, we do, so we avoid, so we do not end up with such catastrophic numbers? What needs to happen on responding to the unfolding um, humanitarian situation right now? Uh, thank you very much. This is also now a very important agenda in our region. <clears throat> Last week we were uh, discussing with the regional ministers of agriculture and the people who are in charge of drought resilience. <coughs> uh, all member states, the number, the figure tell us that more than 40 million people of the region is, at this time, is food insecure. That number definitely will rise because of the challenges the drought is already continuing for the fourth consecutive years. That region is facing a very acute drought. Not only that, last year and the day the, the before last year, without forgetting the challenge of COVID, uh, which already mm, totally changed the world, but the peculiar for the Horn of Africa is the issue of locusts and as well as flooding, which has taken the significant number of the crops of the farmers, which is still the region is living with it, which we didn't want the war against this flood and uh, as well as the uh, locust invasion. The conflict situation is there in most of the countries in our region, in one way or other way, there are conflicts which exacerbate the situation as well, and displacement of the people from their home to another part or somewhere outside, 
which is also all these complications made the region the cocktail of a lot of challenges. In spite of the world is focused on the challenges in the conflict in Europe, in Ukraine, still our region is still needs the attention of the world. Otherwise, 40 million people, we are talking about 40 million people of the region, which is a very significant amount of number in terms of persons in this world. So is in, in their drought situation. So this is really a real challenge and which needs not the effort of the region. We try to mobilize resources with all our member states as well. But the amount of the resource we mobilized and uh, the challenge that the region is facing is like this. And it, we cannot compare it, even if I don't want to put it in terms of number. But that is really very scary uh, uh, in terms of mobilizing resources. So this is the situation that, that I, can, uh, I was uh, discussing. We were discussing last week with the ministers in charge of agriculture and the drought situation in the region. Ambassador Feldman, um, drought, locust, floods uh, have been all part of the terrible humanitarian situation in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, but of course with the very added significant challenge of the civil war there and um, uh, the difficulties of getting uh, uh, humanitarian uh, aid to the Tigray region. It was something that you were dealing with uh, very intensely in your role as special envoy. Where are we today with the humanitarian situation in, uh, in Tigray? Has there been any improvement? What are the challenges? Um, th thank thanks, Dr. Faber Brown, for the question. And, um, and let me just say it's wonderful to be sitting next to my friend and partner from the Horn, Dr. Dr. Workney, um, in this event. Um, there is an improvement in the humanitarian situation um, in the humanitarian deliveries, There's, but it's insufficient. Um, but in terms of, of the amounts of delivery, it's, it's increased. Um, there's a commitment on the, on the, of the various parties to, to see that the humanitarian assistance and the humanitarian situation is, is alleviated, the humanitarian assistance moves. Um, and this is, and it's important, of course, it's essential for saving lives. I mean, obviously, it's essential for saving lives, but it's also necessary politically. It's what gives confidence to, to very nascent contacts that are now taking place between, uh, as I understand, between the government and the, and the authorities in, in, in Tigray, in, in Mekele, the capital of, of, of Tigray. Um, there's been, over the, over the past several weeks, there has been a a lot of focus on the humanitarian file on what's happening in the neighboring region of Afar. Afar is the, is the region just next to the, the state of Tigray because that's the, the primary, that's the primary um, rooting for humanitarian assistance. And there, and there was still some, some Tigrayan defense forces, TDF occupation of some of the Afar regions, the Afar, the, and so there was, there was backlash in the, in the region of Afar um, against delivering humanitarian assistance to Tigray. That has been, Prime Minister Abbey himself went to Afar to try to work on some of this. There's been, again, there's been some improvement. Um, it's, insu it's insufficient um, to meet the needs, but it's certainly better than the situation was, say, a, co a couple of months ago. Um, I think that what's, what's important is that the initiation of more humanitarian goods seems to symbolize, to, at least to me, my analysis, that we're in a different stage now in terms of the conflict in Ethiopia, um, where for so long the focus internationally, the fo for, for, for the right reasons, was on northern Ethiopia, was on the situation in Tigray. Um, that's where, that's where the, the hot war was. But it tended, it tended to distract Ethiopian government officials first and foremost, but all of us, from what was happening elsewhere in Ethiopia, from problems in Oromia, your, homes, your home state, from the problems between different ethnic groups in Ethiopia that's not between the Tigrayans and the, and the central government. I mean, during the time that I, was, I had the honor to serve this administration as Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, the purpose of my, of my job was to try to promote peace and prosperity in the Horn of Africa. That was, you know, I was the first person to have, to have held this. There was, there was 
this administration was the first administration to create the position of the Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa. And the idea was that um, we needed to focus on, rather than country by country, but on the region as a whole, and to look for partnerships in the region and beyond to promote peace and prosperity, to promote the transitions in Somalia and Sudan to um, Ethiopia, etc. But in practice, I did spend much of my time on Ethiopia because you cannot have a successful Horn of Africa if you do not have a successful Ethiopia. You know, Ethiopia, a country of 110, 115 million people, um, one of the larger contributors to, to, to UN peacekeeping and, and other peacekeeping forces. Um, so you need to have a successful Ethiopia if you're going to have a successful Horn of, Horn of Africa. There are other things you need as well. But the, but the challenges in Ethiopia are more than just the war in the north. It's the drought that, that Dr. Workney um, talked about, which some people say is the worst in 70 years. The other, the, you know, the other ethnic, the other, um, ethnic challenges. And I guess I, to, to borrow a phrase from the African Union, I saw as my primary purpose when I looked at Ethiopia during the time I had, the, I had the, that position was to try to find a way to silence the guns. The Ethiopians themselves are going to have to deal with the fundamental questions of how Ethiopia should be governed. The, the, sort of the, the, the fundamental differences they have about the central authorities versus the, versus the federal state authorities. Um, those are not questions for the outside. But if, but if the outside world um, can help in silencing the guns, that creates the space for the Ethiopians to have the type of national dialogue that's been announced. It's moving slowly toward national dialogue in a time of... of uh, in a time when emotions aren't so high because humanitarian assistance is not being delivered because people are being killed by, by violence. So I really looked at my job as trying to silence the guns. And right now, I think we are at a turning point where, that war, where the, the war in the north is in a much, much different spot. You, again, nascent contacts between the government and the, and the Tigrayans. I think there's a realization that there's a shared interest on the part of the authorities in Mekele, the, regional, the capital of the regional state of Tigray, and in, and in Addis. Um, about the external about the external threats from Eritrea and about the need to prevent the disintegration of the of the of the state. So I'm I don't want to overstate the case because there's still a lot of problems that have to be worked out. But I'm 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 fairly I'm more optimistic than I would have been a couple of months ago that the delivery of the humanitarian assistance symbolizes that 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 the war in the north is slowing down, allowing the Ethiopians to address the problems elsewhere in the country. Speaking of silencing the guns and a very heroic job you were doing on that, just uh, so our um, viewers um, and interlocutors are up to date, there have been two ceasefires unilaterally announced in March, one by the uh, government of Ethiopia and subsequently also by uh, the TPLF, uh, the Tigray uh, political leadership and its forces withdrew from Afar, uh, about which um, you were speaking. National reconciliation or national dialogue as a start to national reconciliation is often critical precursor for translating that ceasefire into more permanently silencing uh, the guns. And uh, that has had uh, many uh, challenges, one of which was that uh, Prime Minister Abiy um, had at first at least been uh, rejecting engaging uh, uh, the TPLF in the dialogue. From your remarks, I get the sense that there is uh, perhaps a sense uh, that there is more openness now that the TPLF might be brought into the dialogue. And there are several other really difficult issues. Uh, DDR, the mobilization, disarmament, of uh, non-federal forces, especially as um, uh, the prime minister also mobilized uh, militias across the country that are very strongly ethnically based, already not paid, already engaging in uh, criminality and, and new forms of violence that we are seeing, as well as any kind of accountability for the very significant atrocities and human rights uh, uh, abuses uh, that were committed. What are your reflections, uh, Mr. Ambassador, on how to um, start tackling those issues? What kind of support can the international community provide to work through both the issues of power distribution between Addis and uh, other regions, but also those issues specifically? I mean, the, fu the fundamental issues that led to the outbreak of the, of the, of the war in the north, uh, the war between the, the 
the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front that you know, had governed Ethiopia for 27 years and the central government, those, those fundamental issues about, the, uh, um, about power and governance are not issues that we, in the, that we outside are going, to be able to, are going to be able to resolve. The issues between the um, Amhara the, and, the, and the Oromo, the two largest ethnic groups, are not ones that we're going to solve. The fundamental issues that led to the, to the conflict are not ones that we ha- where we have answers. It's going, to, it's going to have to be Ethiopians have answers. But I don't think the Ethiopians are going to be able to sit down and roll up their sleeves and have a genuine, transparent um, national dialogue the way that the prime minister has 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 said that he wants to he he wants to see while there's active fighting going on. Um, so to the extent that that the African Union um, facilitation, the rest of us be playing supportive roles, you know the you know, the United States, et cetera, can find ways to open channels between these groups that lower the tensions, that, that, that lower the amount of fighting. It creates the atmosphere by which the Ethiopians would have a better chance of successfully addressing, addressing these issues. Um, and, and I really do have the sense that there is a realization, both in Mekele, the, you know, the capital of, of the regional state of Tigray, and in Addis, the prime minister and, and his advisors, of a shared interest in, as I said earlier, preventing the disintegration of the state that allows them to think more creatively, despite the horrors of the past 18 months, about how they might be able, I cooperate might be too big of a word, but how they might find common cause in preserving the, the Ethiopian state and in addressing the issues of the criminality going forward. Accountability is going to be a big issue because there's, 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 um, there have been abuses committed by all sides. Um, and I, I think that what the, the, what the Ethiopian people are going to want to see is some sense of, is, is to feel some sense of dignity, some sense that, that they've had um, their, their, grievances, their grievances addressed. And I don't know what the, I don't know what the answer is on accountability. Um, but all of these issues can be addressed much more constructively if there is humanitarian assistance being delivered and people aren't starving. If the if the humanitarian and the humanitarian assistance has to include those areas so affected by the drought, not just not just the north, and if the if the active fighting has wound down. Mm. And uh, just uh, two days ago, a few days ago, uh, the World Bank announced a 300 million uh, package for um, Ethiopia for reconstruction in places um, like uh, Tigray, uh, Afar, and Amara, but also elsewhere in other places, uh, Oromia, uh, and elsewhere where other forms of violence, insecurity, uh, have also been taking place. Yeah, yeah, because if you if you solve the problem between Tigray and Addis, that doesn't solve the problem of Ethiopia. You, know, you can't you can't look at that in isolation. Mm. Let me still uh, ask you the next question before going back to His Excellency, uh, and that Sudan. That was another very significant part um, of your portfolio, and we have of course seen the uh, coup d'état uh, in the fall, and since then um, suppression of. Um, protest, often quite uh, brutally, with significant use of sexual violence. Uh, We have seen um, very limited progress um, uh, toward any kind of easing. But nonetheless, in recent weeks, there is the promise that the uh, emergency degree, uh, the state of emergency will be suspended. Few people have been released from uh, prison and the United States impose significant sanction on, on Sudan. And unlike in the case of Ethiopia, where many of the sanctions were quite tailored, in the case of Sudan, there were very blanket sanctions, uh, compounding a really very difficult economic situation in the country with massive inflation, uh, massive uh, spike um, uh, in prices of basic fuel, basic food. What else can be done um, by the international community to encourage the, the junta to move toward more substantive liberalization? I think, there's, I think there's several tasks that the international community has when it, com- when it, comes, to, when it comes to Sudan. You've described the situation um, I, um, you know, accurately in terms of my understanding as, my understanding as well. But, but, but one thing that needs to happen, and it needs to happen quickly, is for, the, is for the United States and the rest of the international community to figure out how to address the humanitarian needs in the country. You mentioned, you mentioned sanctions. Um, 
In fact, the sanctions in, uh, on Sudan are just the central police. That's the only sanctions. But, I think, but, but you're right in raising this because what the United States did do is pause. Pause the assistance. It's not sanctions mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's not cancellation. It's a pause. And the reason why it was a, why it was a pause was the idea that if the, if the coup could be reversed quickly, then the assistance could flow again quite quickly, rather than, rather than going through congressional notification and, and reprogramming funds and all of that. Um, but now, you ha and the humanitarian assistance continues. The, the purely humanitarian assistance continues. But a lot of what was considered to be development assistance, whether it was World Bank or bilateral, went through the governments and ultimately benefited, benefited families. That's the part that's been suspended, that's been paused mm -hmm. by the World Bank and by bilateral donors. And if there are mechan and, and there need to be found mechanisms, similar to what's, what people are looking at for Afghanistan, you could say, by which you can take that what was development assistance and that, that ultimately benefited families, that went through ministries for family support programs and things like that, and put them through other other mechanisms to get to to get them to the families. And there's an urgency here. There's an urgency not only because the humanitarian needs are great and growing because of food prices escalation, because of, of poor harvest and the drought, but also because a significant amount of money going through the World Bank's um, um, IDA program, the highly indebted poor country program, will expire at the end of June, will be reprogrammed at the end of June if there not, can't be a mechanism. So one thing we have to do, it's not, and I'm, I'm not, I'll get to your question, but one thing that we need to do collectively is find the mechanisms that can channel some of that suspended assistance back to people in need through humanitarian means. And it's bureaucratically complicated, but it needs to happen. Um, in terms of the 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 pressure on the pressure on, as you described the junta, the pressure on the, the pressure on the generals. I don't know, Von. There was one thing. It was it was something that um, you know haunted haunted me during the last few months that I was that I had this job because we were using the tools that we had, and the it was not having the same the impact that we would have liked to have seen. Now there's been some improvement lately. The the um, violence against the protesters, while it still happens, is not as bad as it was. Of course, the protests are also not as large as they were. There's been, I, I think, it's 60 some people released recently. I think there's still over 100 that are still that are still in prison. The state of emergency has been decreed. There's been some there's been some um, improvement in the political situation. The um, uh, Dr. Dr. Workney and Egad have a have a um, representative that's part of a sort of a trilateral. Um, um, facilitation mechanism. It's UN, African Union, EGAD, that is that are talking to that are talking to the um, the various political parties, religious groups, civil groups, the resistance committees, and the military to try to map out where there are overlaps um, in in ideas on how to move forward. To try to come, you know, eventually come up with a, you know, some a Sudanese roadmap to get to get back. But I think we're going to have to be fairly patient because I don't think I think the generals are are fairly well dug in at this point. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, I was, you know, the last time I was in Sudan, we'll be we'll be honest. The last time I was in Sudan was October twenty fourth. It was the day before the coup, um, and I met with the, the then prime minister. As well as as well as General Hamedi and General Bur and General Burhan, General Burhan being the you know the head of the Sovereignty Council, that's sort of the the, the, the presidency of Sudan, um, to talk and to talk about mechanisms to try to address the concerns that were then plaguing the transition, and one of the things that the generals were complaining about was how the civilians aren't united. Um, well, I think it's. I think all of us who are Americans can look out across our country and say, you know, in in democratic political debate, citizens often aren't united. This is not unique. One of the things that I find interesting is, at times, you get a little glimpse that the military is also not united. Um, it's not simply that the civilians aren't united. You see some differences, and is there a way that those differences can be used to to build different alliances to to move forward? I mean. I, it's not going to be realistic. The civilians aren't going to like, like, me, like to hear me say this to completely sideline the military in the short term. Um, but how do you get the military comfortable with the idea that Sudan is going to be a democracy where the people um, elect their leaders and that the leaders are accountable to the people? How do you get to that point when you're um, when the starting point is now that there's been a, there's been a coup and, and entrenched interests from the military? 
Your Excellency, very much welcome your thoughts on the situation in Sudan, but let me add another dimension, which is the recurrence of attacks that we are now seeing by the Janjaweed, or today the Rapid uh, Support Force in Darfur. And just to remind everyone, uh, to, uh, almost two decades ago, two decades ago in 2003, when uh, the conflict in Darfur started um, with... Uh, Arab uh, militias um, attacking more indigenous um, uh, black African populations. We ended up with over 300,000 uh, people dead. And it's a region, uh, Darfur, that's very rich in a variety of resources, including gold and the extraction of gold, uh, including linked to international actors like Russia, has become a very significant source of conflict uh, in Africa, in northern Nigeria, in Mali, um, in various other parts. It's playing out um, in the current um, Dafur um, situation as well. How can um, institutions like IDA, IGAD uh, help um, look at the situation in, in southern uh, Sudan, in Dafur, to make sure that we do not see an escalation of uh, violence there? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff, for... Uh the service when we were there, uh, uh, even if we did not uh, resolve our issue, our issues, but still we are uh, working on it, and definitely it is not going to be uh, resolved, uh, some of the things. So uh, before I go to Sudan, uh, I have to say something about my own country, Ethiopia, uh, that is, uh, it is not um, easy for me to jump into Sudan before I said definitely uh, uh, Jeff has said uh, some of his points but for me as an Ethiopian citizen uh, as a father of boys uh, I want to see Ethiopia a peaceful Ethiopia a country which in fact a long history civilization very uh, hard-working people who really can resolve their own issues by their um, own terms and conditions, but unfortunately, for a long time, have a history of conflict. Uh, unfortunately, the challenge that we were facing for the last years in this transition to the democracy that would have been resolved uh, peacefully. As IGAD, we were very clear on that thing, uh, uh, first and foremost. Well, uh, one thing the government and uh, uh, the, the authority in Tigray that we should commend the, the first step of humanitarian truce that Jeff was talking was one step ahead that even if it is not sufficient enough, you know, getting uh, uh, humanitarian assistance to the farmers, the poor people in the region is really a very important aspect that may, let, may, may save a life of uh, so many children as well as the people who need these things. Ultimately, the solution is what the government of Prime Minister Abiy has laid out all-inclusive dialogue, discussion, genuine all-inclusive discussion. Uh, that will be the time that Ethiopians should show to the world that they can really can resolve their own things by their discussing on all issues, all aspects, and come to the consensus on on, on, on not, not all, definitely, there will be uh, differences, but to, to, to deal the situations in this uh, very inclusive way, that will be the most inter important point that already that commission has established. Some of the opposition leaders are saying that it is not going to work because of these this reasons, but the most important thing is making a genuine discussion and resolving the challenge that we are facing. This is a point I want to make uh, about Ethiopia. Uh, the Sudan issue, uh, in spite of what uh, Jeff said, 
uh, I was there before one month uh, to, 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 to know, before two months, to, to, to analyze, uh, to, to at least to, fact, to, to finding the fact what is really a best way to deal the situation, the challenge that the Sudanese are facing, to help the Sudanese people and the politicians there. One thing that we were very clear was the opposition themselves were deeply divided. Some of them, they cannot sit on the same roof to discuss the challenges that they are facing. The gap between the military council and the opposition is very big. Uh, with all these challenges, uh, the multilateral institutions, in spite of all member states, including the United States and others, the African Union and uh, the neighboring countries, they are pushing towards peace in Sudan. Now, the very visible platform is the tripartite effort to bring together the parties, to bring a civilian government in Sudan. In fact, that process is not very fast process. There is full of challenges. Last week, we have started the first Sudanese to Sudanese dialogue under uh, uh, this tripartite platform. This is one aspect. But the most important thing, what we have said is the, 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 we should not punish Sudanese, but we have to pressure Sudanese to bring back to, 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 to what they were before one year. Very important, which was celebrated by international community, the civilian government which was leading uh, Sudanese to the democratic process for democracy. So uh, we, international community, the regional RECs, including IGAD, what we are doing is, number one, working with the authorities, the political forces in Sudan to resolve that, to bring them together at least to, to, to resolve the situation. The second one is prioritizing all the parties to, to bring to resolve, not to go back to, 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 to the time of the previous government, but still they have the moral, the leadership in Sudan, including the military, they have the moral obligation to bring back Sudanese to their aspiration, the aspiration which they did for uh, in the street of Khartoum. I want to be sure that we have enough time for uh, our audience, uh, and I am tempted to ask a myriad of questions uh, to our very distinguished and knowledgeable guests um, uh, about um, uh, what's happening in the Horn, but I'll satisfy myself with a, a question to each of you and then hand over to Mike uh, and all of you uh, for continuing the discussion. Let me uh, just stay with you, uh, Your Excellency, and ask about uh, Kenya. Uh, Kenya is a very important country uh, in uh, the Horn of Africa, and it's a very important country in Africa and internationally, and it's facing very important elections, uh, presidential elections, uh, this August. Uh, it's been struggling, uh, like much of the region, with difficult economic situation, um, very high inflation, battered by debt, uh, battered by COVID and its consequences for decline in tourism, its consequences for biodiversity, poaching, protection. Uh, but these elections are very interesting. They're fascinating because for the first time in Kenyan history, uh, the top um, candidates for the presidential po position are not a Kikuyu. Uh, even though they both um, have, uh, it's Luo, uh, uh, Mr. Odinka, and uh, Kalajin, uh, Mr. Ruto, even though they both have uh, Kikuyu vice presidential candidates. It's fascinating because Mr. Odinka has been endorsed uh, by his longtime rival, Mr. Kenyatta, for the presidency. Very unusual um, alliance there. Um, what is your... Um, uh, sense of the elections. What are you looking for? Are there risks that we could see repeats of violence like in 2007? Are the elections a um, source of promise and perhaps optimism uh, because uh, of uh, what the, the makeup of the top candidates looks like? Your thoughts on that? The, the political dynamism in Kenya uh, at this very particular time 
clearly stipulates that Kenya is now in full election mode. Uh, everything that you can see is the feeling of competition uh, that all the contenders without any kind of security challenges, problems, conflicts. At this stage, things like going in the right direction that to, to, to the Kenyan people are, are working. Of course, last week, there was a major development that you have mentioned. Uh, the, 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 the people of Kenya was waiting. Who is really going to be the deputies for the candidate for presidency. That was one of the, 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 the very important question uh, for all, for the, for the electorate of uh, Kenya. That is already answered. Now, Kenya is a country, one of democratically, uh, we, we can call it an example for the region. In spite of all the challenges, Without saying this is Kukuyu or this is Luo, the dynamism looks like that things are going all out competition in very vibrant media, um, campaign from all sides. This all shows that things look like from inside healthy. But still, uh, the security organs, especially the leaders of the society, all should, you know, should 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 uh, have a responsibility not to lead this kind of very healthy uh, competition that which, which leads to a real democratic outcome of the election should not lead to an, any another form. For now, I am very optimistic that things are going very well. I'm not expecting and I'm not seeing. At this particular time, things are going to go to 2007. But always we should be very cautious. Election is most of the time is all about emotion. Uh, so that emotion should be handled very well. Uh, so uh, uh, the Kenyan election process will be one of a litmus test for our region that how democracy evolve in our region. And emotions are certainly already very much part of the campaign. There is significant amount of um, disinformation taking place in various platforms and media in Kenya. This has become, unfortunately, so much part and parcel of uh, politics and electoral competitions around the world. And significant amount of highly emotions bordering on uh, perhaps very in, uh, in, inflammatory language also taking place. My last question, um, um, Ambassador um, Feldman, uh, to you. In your very distinguished diplomatic career, you have uh, dealt with much wider portfolio uh, than uh, the Horn of Africa. You had global portfolio, in fact, mm -hmm. um, uh, in your uh, role at the United Nations. And um, I want to ask you geopolitical questions and its implications for the Horn of Africa, for Africa. Ukraine has... Um, put an end to the uh, post-Cold uh, War era. It has put an end to the post-9-11 era. There is no more um, international agreement that non-state armed actors are um, to be countered. In fact, uh, in my view, we are back to uh, your terrorist is my freedom fighter and vice versa. <laughs> but even before Ukraine visibly put an end to this, we have seen highly um, conflictual regional rivalries playing out in various parts of Africa, embracing certain uh, government actors or rival politicians, embracing certain militias. And we have also seen Russia policy in Africa being directly geared towards simply countering uh, the United States, almost um, irrespective of the substance. Whatever the U.S. was doing, we would do the opposite, often using groups like Wagner Group in places like Mali, um, uh, promising authoritarian governments that um, uh, whatever they do, uh, regardless of human rights abuses, Russia will support them. What are your reflections on how this new geopolitical era, we will be able to achieve what your primary goals were, uh, safety, peace, and prosperity in the Horn of Africa or beyond? How can we deal with the new geopolitics? <laughs> 
I mean, I'm glad you raised the question because something we haven't we haven't talked about, um, Workney, is is the role of the outsiders inside the Horn of Africa, the extensive role that outsiders play in the Horn of Africa, and that's probably something we neglected before in, in this audience. Um, I remember, um, for example, on one of my trips, where I was I was I was in Doha and Dubai and Riyadh and Abu Dhabi. Um, Cairo, talking, you know, talking to these countries um, to try to to try to see where we could where we could work together to promote you know, stability in the Horn of Africa, and there was there was somebody who went out on Twitter and said, you know, the U.S. envoy in the Horn of Africa is in Dubai and Riyadh and Cairo. Has he looked at a map? Um, and it's like, yeah, we've looked at a geopolitical map. You know that, that these outside countries are the ones that are that were playing a significant, in some cases, decisive role inside the horn of, inside the Horn of Africa. I mean, you can't talk about the um, what happens. You can't talk about moving forward in Sudan if you aren't also talking with the Emiratis and the Saudis and the Turks and the you know the Israelis. Um, in terms of in terms of Russia, I mean, we saw very nefarious Russian. Influence, particularly in Sudan, Ethiopia, I, less so. But in Sudan, very, very definitely, you know, the Russians trying to basically disrupt a civilian transition. Um, so one of the challenges was how how do you build a coalition to insulate a transition against the um, encouragement of the Russians to the military to just move against the civilians? Um, I found the Chinese position sort of interesting. Um, because it makes me wonder if there's a potential that I certainly didn't have the, the diplomatic talent to realize, but there's, if there's a potential of some cooperation with China when it comes to places like Ethiopia. Because China's, China's concern about Ethiopia, from our discussion with Chinese officials, was clearly Ethiopia's stability. You know, given the, the exposure, the financial exposure that, that China has in Ethiopia, it's the... It's the um, Given the amount the, the amount of money that Ethiopia owes China, China does not want to see an implosion of Ethiopia. Neither do we. We don't want to see an implosion of Ethiopia. Now, obviously, the Ethiopians don't want to see an implosion of their country. So, you know, is there a way to work with China? I don't think the same potential exists with Russia. I think Russia is just a spoiler. Thank you all for that fascinating first hour. And now we've got about a half hour of discussion, as Vonda said. What I'm going to do now is play the role of moderator. And, and now Vonda can put on the hat of a panelist as well as joining the other two. And we'll invite your questions in just a minute. I'm going to begin, however, with a round from the remote audience that we've already received. And I'm just going to combine and conflate a couple of them for the panel as a whole. People can respond to any one or two. I've got about three questions for the group. and then. Uh, Please be prepared with your questions right, th right after that. And we'll still be, for those of you out in virtual space, hello again. Thanks for staying with us. And if you still would like to email in questions at this point to events at brookings.edu, uh, we'll try to maybe get a couple more of those through my colleagues who are monitoring the uh, email in just a second. But let me, let me begin with the ones we've already received previously from uh, the virtual audience. And I'm going to target one specifically, Vonda, towards you, and then, but then the you know, other questions for anybody who wants to take them. Vonda, you just asked about non-state actors uh, in regard to Ukraine and elsewhere. I wondered if you could say a word about non-state actors in the Horn. You're the director of our initiative. You've, you're the founding director of our initiative at Brookings. And I wondered where you see the most important dynamics. You've already mentioned, in passing at least, the John Jaweed. Uh, we know about Somalia and the various clans and militias. But if there's any other dynamic that's really caught your attention recently, I wondered if you might want to comment on that. And then for uh, Ambassador Feltman and uh, His Excellency Dr. Workney, uh, the, the, the questions from the audience sort of coalesce into uh, your thoughts on longer-term vision for the region. And, and Jeff, you just touched on this a bit with thinking about the whole broader region. But maybe uh, if you could, most of the questions we got sort of focused in on one country or another, and specifically on Somalia and Ethiopia, uh, most of all. And even though, Jeff, you said you didn't want to start offering suggestions about internal 
decisions on power sharing or, or you know, constitutional changes. Uh, if either one of you or any, any, any of the three of you want to talk about your vision for what Somalia could look like in 10 years that could finally begin to stabilize that country, or your vision for what Ethiopia could look like in 10 years, they could get it back on the path towards prosperity with a sense of consensus around how to share power between the center and the regions, those thoughts would be welcome. So, Vonda, if I could begin with you, and then we'll just work through the panel. Well, the challenge of non-stream armed actors in the Horn of Africa and more broadly in Africa remains enormous. And um, many states um, have uh, had uh, limited uh, uh, state authority, state capacity, uh, even states that uh, are seemingly very powerful in some of the most important uh, countries in, uh, in Africa, like in Nigeria. Uh, Moreover, often the solution of dealing with um, a variety of security problems in the Horn has been raising um, unofficial forces. That's been a key feature of um, Ethiopia, and seemingly uh, it helped uh, uh, the government of Ethiopia hold uh, the TDF uh, expansion in the fall, but already now it's starting to present very significant challenge. So state fragmentation, um, state weakening uh, remains massive issues. In Somalia, the defining uh, security actors really, or insecurity actors really are uh, non-state armed actors, militias. Mm -hmm. And certainly even in places like Kenya, the issue of uh, terrorism, Shabab's reach, other radical jihadi groups, uh, as well as uh, other non-state armed actors uh, remains massive. And so, you know, I mentioned that we are in this uh, end of uh, nine, post 9-11 era. Uh, it would be f uh, a grave mistake, grave analytical mistake, grave state building mistake to ignore uh, the persistence of uh, non-state armed actors and the challenges they pose and new challenges that will come online. Uh, one of the defining issues for uh, the region will be the rising conflict of herders versus farmers compounded by... Uh, overuse of land, uh, compounded by zoonotic diseases and compounding and amplifying zoonotic diseases and, of course, uh, climate change. So even as we have this highly conflictual geopolitical situation and, and conflictual, often regional situation, uh, the, the low actor, the low-scale uh, conflict, the subnational conflict will not have disappeared. It will simply interact in even more difficult ways um, with the uh, geopolitical environment. I would just add my comments here that uh, in the fall, um, um, when uh, the United States uh, left Afghanistan and we saw the Taliban take over, a lot of my uh, time was spent dealing with uh, various African countries as far back as uh, Mozambique and elsewhere. And their predominant sense was, oh, my God, the terrorists are coming over and they will take over. And there's a sense that there was not sufficient appreciation for how robust, vibrant, and growing threat of um, jihadi and other non-jihadi, non-state armed actors remained. Thank you. Jeff, over to you, please. Well, let me talk about, the, I mean, you know, 10 years now, 10 years from now with Ethiopia, for example, hmm. um, and of course we have an Ethiopian citizen next to me. Um, but go back first. Okay, for the, for the 27 years that the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, dominated the, the Ethiopian government under Prime Minister Mellis, um, there was a promotion of something that's called ethnic federalism, you know, which is you know, that, these, that, that there are these federal states that, that are based primarily, not, not only, but primarily on the, the major ethnic group of that state. So you have a Romeo, you have you know, um, you know, the Amhara region, Tigray regions, and so forth. And Prime Minister Abbey coming in office in 2018 had a, had a, a vision of transcending that a vision of an Ethiopian national identity that, that wouldn't erase the ethnic identity, but would transcend the ethnic identity. The problem you have now, and then, you know, and as, as Americans with our melting pot, pot myth and stuff, it's a, sort of an appealing vision that you transcend your, your ethnic division to, be, to feel Ethiopian. Um, the problem is that, this, is that the conflicts have actually exacerbated the ethnic feelings. You know, you, you've, you've got a stronger sense of being Tigrayan now, a stronger sense of being Amhara. I think it's harder to roll back, get, roll back the ethnic federalism now than it was when Prime Minister Abiy was looking to, looking, looking to do that back when he came into office in 2018. But 10 years from now, if you've stopped the fighting, if you've been able to have a successful national dialogue, maybe these sorts of, maybe then you have, by then you have 
an Ethiopia that's not always at risk of imploding because of the, the of ethnic things. The other thing you're going to have within 10 years from now is surely within 10 years there'll be a change of leadership in Eritrea. And one hopes that Eritrea would be playing a more constructive regional role than Eritrea currently is. You know, Eritrea is playing on these differences inside Ethiopia. It's playing on the differences inside, inside Sudan and Somalia. Um, and I can't imagine that President Isaias is still going to be doing that 10 years from now. Thank you. Doctor, <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the, 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 point, the point that we were discussing uh, for the last one hour uh, and what will be the prospect of the region, uh, I don't know for how many years, uh, whatever, but let me uh, put it this way. Uh, this region is uh, the most dynamic region of our continent. Number one, in terms of political dynamism. I sometimes say it needs a deep analysis and uh, uh, discussion on this video. This region is a region with transition. Some countries are already transitioned. Some countries are facing the challenge of transition. Some, uh, some countries are inevitably going to such kind of process. Uh, that will bring exactly what uh, you have said about the state formation, the state reformation, even deformation of the region. And also, from outside, what Jeff said, the foreign policy instrument of the other external forces in whatever the agenda they have, they can shape, reshape this regional dynamism. So uh, sometimes it is very difficult to see a full picture of the region, what it looks like in a short period of time. But the most important thing here is, in spite of all the challenges throughout the continent or internationally, the region will remain a very strategic region for the world that is very near to the Red Sea, which is most of the trade of international trade call and what the Red Sea uh, trade, the Red Sea, the sea, security, all these dynamisms will see the region as one of a very important region, which always attracts the interest of the external actors, in fact, while the internal actors are struggling within themselves, as well as struggling <laughs> from the outside said, while they are trying to, 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 to address the aspiration of the people of the region, while that is democracy in the region. So it's a kind of a cocktail of different things that that region is living. Definitely, sometimes this challenge needs a leadership. Leadership, this challenge can be solved, to, can be changed to the opportunity. So that's how I see uh, 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 this region. This region always sees the mind of the politicians, the diplomats, and the people who really define the, the countries who define their own national interest and national security aspect as well. It's fantastic. One quick follow-up from me, and then please be preparing your questions, and I'll take a couple at a time in just a moment. You, you talked about political dynamism in the region. How about relative economic dynamism and opportunity? The Horn of Africa, your country, had some of the highest growth rates in the world for a while, but also has some of the greatest problems in places like Somalia. How do you rate, and your job is about development uh, today, how do you rate the region's economic prospects compared to the rest of Africa and the broader region? Exactly. That is one point that should be addressed under this umbrella as well. Economic situation in our region, despite the situation that we are living in, 
despite the natural challenge that we are facing, the inflation because of drought and also because of the conflict in Ukraine, which really changed the food chain of the, the region, which we get, uh, if I'm not wrong, more than 70% of wheat and as well as fertilizer, gas, all these things. Already we are feeling the, the heat of the, 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 the conflict in Ukraine. When, when I saw, or when I put all these things, it is very clear that this region is going to pass in very protracted economic challenges, while 60, 65% of the users of the region, which they need employment, and now facing the issue of bread, that will inevitably can lead them for some kind of riot that will question the status quo of the government as well. So there are these kind of complications that should be sorted out very clearly. But economically, really, we have a challenge. But the potential of the region is there. The potential in terms of agriculture, that region is one of the best, most fertile region in terms of uh, oil and other uh, this mining things, I'm not going to express this. With all the things that we have, this is the time that uh, uh, needs. Also the issue of social issues which related to internal displacement, migration, and as well as the people who are you know, migrating from their home for the better life from one place to the other, including crossing the big waters. That are the challenges that the region is facing. Thank that you. should be covered by the, F, by, the, by the leadership of the committed leadership of the region, as well as by assistance of international, but most importantly from the region. Thank you very much. So we've got some old friends. Good to see you all in the audience. Why don't we start right here in the in the middle row, and maybe if we take two. Uh, could you please identify yourselves as you pose your question? So starting right here, please. Thank you. Great to be back. <laughs> Good to see you, man. Uh, Doug Brooks. I'm with FGI Solutions these days. Uh, we are uh, working in the Horn of Africa and Somalia, especially supporting the uh, security sector reform. Uh, my question is actually on the U.S. troops that are going, that have been announced are going in Somalia. Uh, they've been absent for quite a while, and I'm kind of curious, uh, was there backsliding in terms of the security situation in Somalia with, when the U.S. left? And what do we expect these 500 troops to do in the future? Excellent. Thank you. Ma'am, here in the fifth row. This one? Well, I'll take two or three first, and then we'll come back to you guys. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hello. My name is Deborah Shine. And um, I was, EGAT has led twice. I would, I'd like to go to Sudan, which has been described as a very unstable region, a dynamic but unstable region. I don't think anybody will argue with that. And EGAT has twice led a peace agreement in South Sudan, but the peace agreement is not moving forward. The pro there's problems in ABA is not resolved, or for the whole issue, and they're all interconnected. What South Sudan at the moment may be teetering on another conflict. What is being done in the, the, by EGAD in that area? Dr. Workenay, would you like to start with either or both of those questions? Let me go to, to South Sudan issue. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't hear the first one uh, very uh, accurately. So South Sudan is another new nation in, 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 in Igad region, which we will, all of us hope that with all the potential that that, that country has and uh, using the late camera advantage as a state will, will come to, to, to the bigger uh, uh, developmental trajectory. Uh, we all of us know that the conflict in South Sudan, uh, the political dynamism, what Igar was doing uh, in peace initiative, uh, what Igar uh, bring the parties together to resolve this, these challenges. Uh, but that process is a very long process. Uh, in this process, a lot of things have happened, damage happened, South Sudan still is a volatile country, but 
the good thing that after we implemented the peace agreement of South Sudan, the first chapter, the challenge was implementing the second chapter, that is the security arrangement uh, chapter. That would be we in IGAD commended the leadership of South Sudan. Would they agreed at least in the highest echelon uh, to, 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 to share power that, that, that will, that even if it is a delicate one, that, that needs uh, another a positive step. So South Sudan issue, slowly but surely going, things are in the right direction, but still we have no guarantee that Sudanese, South Sudanese can come back to the security challenges. So the international community, IGAD, one of the things that we are doing is consolidating that peace process is one of very important things that we are doing and we are working. We have a special envoy on that issue. Daily one of the things that we are working with the Sudanese, South Sudanese authority is about the peace process of South Sudan. Thank you. Ambassador Feldman and then Dr. Feldbad Brown. Well, I, you know, there's definitely been an erosion in the security in, in, in Somalia, um, but I don't know, Von, is, do you see a causal link between the withdrawal of the U.S. of the U.S. troops under President Trump and that, and that deterioration? I, I don't know. Um, well, there's been, there's been some deterioration that can be linked to uh, the withdrawal of U.S. Special Operations Forces, specifically in the morale and capacity of the elite um, Somali unit DANAP that the United States trained. So you know, we are seeing very similar dynamics there, like in Afghanistan, without U.S. permanent on-the-ground presence, that elite counterterrorism unit has been deteriorated. Uh, and um, so the hope is that putting a small permanent um, uh, open-ended uh, counterterrorism special operations force on the ground will beef up uh, the NAP. However, um, uh, and the second effect uh, of that is supposed to be the capacity to uh, more effectively target uh, Shabab with drones, and that, that has been happening. Airstrikes have been going on, and they have picked up even before uh, this deployment. That limits uh, Shabab's capacity to mass, and perhaps can prevent attacks like we have seen at the beginning of May on the Atmi space, so very dramatic Shabab success. Um, Finally, the third element why the Special Operations Forces are heading back is there is some sense that on-the-ground presence can provide disruption and intelligence to prevent threats by Shabab to U.S. forces in Kenya and U.S. bases in the, elsewhere in the region. But I don't believe that in any fundamental way it changes the profound deterioration of security that has been really taking place in 2017. It simply slows down uh, the rate of deterioration yeah. that we are seeing in the country. But um, if uh, Atmis did not materialize, uh, Shabab uh, would have been in a very easy position to take much of uh, Somalia south of Mogadishu, including Mogadishu. And, and the deployment of your special operations forces is not changing that. It's simply reducing the rate of deterioration. So let's take a second round, and then I'm going to come to Brad in a second for uh, remote questions that are coming in, we understand. So if I could go in the second row here with the two hands, please. Ma'am, you first. Thank you so much. Here, here's a microphone. Oh. Thanks again for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, a couple of real questions from a real Ethiopian citizen, right? So Alex Rondos in 2012 saw all of this coming. He was at the Wilson Center, and he saw all of this coming, and everybody's on. I know for sure you know more than I know. Me. Yes, yes, and you as well. So the State Department currently has two bills that it's trying to work with regarding Ethiopia, and that's um, the Senate and the House have bills basically asking Ethiopia to A, stop the war, allow humanitarian aid into Tigray, stop the killings in Oromia. The Somali region is in tatters. The locusts and the drought everybody knew about. Um, somebody's turning this off, it's not nice. So um, a while back, there was a major drought. There were locusts, but you didn't get to hear about it 
because the state of Ethiopia was strong enough. And you and I met before when Kasa Tekla Burhan was an ambassador here. I don't think you remember me because I've changed quite a bit. I had a baby. So here's my worry is that it's personal for me because it's my family. It's personal for me, and I don't even know how to be afraid anymore. I'm not scared of the Ethiopian state, the CIA, or anyone else, because when you lose everything, you actually fear nothing. So I am going to say this here and now, and it's being recorded. I will say the most honest answer that was provided, and somebody's cutting it off again. They're not cutting it off. Please, please get your question, and we got to move Let on. Let me we got do that. Seven minutes. Okay, then because it's not even lighting. So the most honest answer provided thus far has been Ambassador Feldman's intense blush when asked about how did it go so far. Because you know you were there for how many months and you were able to accomplish exactly zilch. There is no cessation of hostilities. The question. And the question is, I want to survive as a human being on this planet as much as your child does, but my country is going to be in hell for the foreseeable future because there's a, you know about this, EGAD's framework for the reform of Ethiopian refugee laws makes it such that there is no Ethiopian sovereignty, there is no Ethiopian territorial integrity at the moment because between the IOM, the UNHCR, and EGAD, everybody's agreed that Ethiopia is going to be the dystopian future slave farm for the world where we're going to be providing wheat. Okay. So my question is, will you allow your humanity to actually counteract your economic and geopolitical interest? I hope that question is very clear. I hope somebody answers. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Over here, and then we'll go to Brad, and then we'll come back to the panel for the final responses. Oh, hello. It's good to see all of you again after COVID-19. I, I have two questions. I hope you don't mind. Um, my first question, I you know, agree with uh, the ambassador here. The Ethiopian issue is complex, but different regions have different issues here. Um, right now, in the Somali region, um, you have the Chinese there who are drilling for oil. And this oil is, well, the, the, the report is that people are dying from a known disease. It's massive. You know, it was reported by Voice of America, uh, by the Daily Guide, by the Guardian. And so, but no one hears about this. And so I spoke to the ONLF this morning, and they informed me they have no intention to make any trouble. They're going to abide by the 2018 agreement, obviously. But they're concerned. Their people are dying because the Chinese are drilling oil there. So my question is, what is the U.S. government trying to do to counter the Chinese sometimes negative effect in Africa from drilling practices and all that? That's the first question. My second question has to do with Somalia. As we know, a few weeks ago, the Somaliland president was here in America uh, at the Heritage Foundation. He's seeking independence for his country. I understand that. Um, but there's a big issue here. I've been speaking to the Klan members on the ground in Somalia. The Eastside Klan dominates the government. So it's one clan of four. You have four opposing clans who are like, we don't really want this because independence in, my mind, in their mind is U.S. aid and U.S. arms to them. And so they're not really happy about this move. And so my question here is, sometimes, don't you think U.S. policies, like we have two bills in the House, one bill in the House and one in the Senate, that in some way quasi recognizes Somaliland as an independent country? And this is causing tension on the ground. My question is, you know, is it sensible to have bills like this in, in, in Congress that might cause problems on the ground to resolve these problems? Thank you. Thank you. And then, Brad, do we have a question from the... Yeah, Colorado? two questions from the audience watching online. Uh, one is, what's the likelihood for the East African Federation to be established to mitigate cross-border violence? Uh, the second question is really an observation that Djibouti hasn't been mentioned yet by the panel. So if there's any observations that the panelists have about Djibouti's involvement in the region and these issues. Okay, so to recap, we've got a question about Djibouti, a question about long-term vision on Ethiopia, a question about China's influence in the broader region, and then also a question on Somaliland. So if I could ask each of you to wrap up here with whatever fraction of that litany you'd like to address, and Dr. Workenay will give you privilege of uh, first response. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the, the very good uh, interaction and questions as well. Uh, let me start from the, the final question that is a very important to my organization and for myself, the uh, cross-border issue of the region. 
the like other African countries, uh, uh, the region, the district borders are for us the source of challenges as well as opportunities as well. If you go to uh, in our region, let me make it a regional one. Let me talk about my region. The the issue of oil that. Uh, my friend was talking and other issues, most of the issues that related to this kind of natural resources are very near to, not to the center of the city or center of the country. It's more of the, most of them are in the periphery areas. The other issue, is the people who are living in the both side of the borders, in most of, in our region member states are almost the same, culturally, in terms of language, in terms of the way of living, sociologically as well. But there is also a common challenge. There is a continuous conflict in border areas, which most of the time happen because of the scarce resource, which is not only for human beings, but for, the, for their own cattle, for the animals, or water, which is also a main source of conflict, which is also very scarce in border areas. So our borders are, have a plenty of things. But also, what IGAD is doing now, despite of all these challenges, let us nurture, let us harvest the opportunity that we have in our borders. Most of the people who are living in the border areas are most of their nomads cross from one country to the other, the people who really doesn't care about the border of this country or that country, only they care about their livelihood, their, uh, their cattle. So making the things easy, that one of the things that we are working on, that just working is how to help them to produce wells in in, in, in how in cattle uh, man nurturing and uh, and making them to improve the way how they are uh, having their own cattle. The other thing is water issue that we are working to have more waters in this border and very dry areas, and at the same time in is protecting, preventing the diseases, human diseases as well as a cattle diseases which we cannot see separately because this the issue of disease in border areas is separately connected. So our major inter intervention is borders. Our, the trade issue also, the regional integration issue that IGAD is established, the very reason IGAD is there is one of the regional integration issue. So the one of the things is trade. So the trade issue harmonizing the policy of the member states, the law, and other trade courts of the member states that we are, uh, IGAD is doing. So that is one of our major focus. Ultimately, our borders are the beginning of our regional integration agenda. So that is what uh, I want to comment on this issue. Great. The other point is uh, the issue of uh, the challenges in terms of migration, what my sister said, all the challenges that we have challenges, of course. The sovereignty issue is all sovereignty comes within, you know, from inside. All, always strength starts from inside. So we have to strengthen ourselves from inside that reflect on outside. That is how I think. Otherwise, all countries are sovereign, for sure. That sovereign, maybe they are not, we cannot be sovereign in terms of economy, but they, our eight member states are equally sovereign to us. One vote for one member state. So whether the, the number of population is 50 million or 10 million, for us, all our member states are equal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. And Jeff, over to you, please. Just a, just a couple um, 
quick comments. Djibouti um, came up, and of course, the, where your headquarters are. I mean, Djibouti is overwhelming. The, the Djiboutian economy is overwhelmingly linked to Ethiopia. The, the trade and transit to Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a landlocked country. The trade goes goes in and out of of, of Djibouti's port. So, to the extent that Ethiopia's economy um, is hurt by the ongoing conflicts inside Ethiopia, Djibouti's hurt even more. So, we address Djibouti's concerns and economic development issues by helping to solve the problems inside inside Ethiopia. Um, congressional, con, you know, congressional um, acts. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I found interesting during the during the time that I was uh, U.S. Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa was how interested um, so many congressional representatives were in what was going on, mm-hmm. and it derived from Americans. It derived from Americans of Ethiopian origin, uh, Americans who, um, of Sudanese origin. Um, and so a lot of the congressional action you see is sparked by their conversations that they have with their constituents. And of course, as a separate branch of government, they could they were interested in hearing hearing from me, but I certainly could not tell them what 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 from the executive branch what the legislative branch should do. But it's but it really was interesting how closely many members of Congress were following the issues in the Horn of Africa because their constituents were following those issues. Um, and on, on the issue of, of humanity, I mean, I, I really, I mean, the, the reason why we want to see peace, stability, prosperity, security in the Horn of Africa is obviously it's in our interest. But it's also because we want to see the Ethiopians, the Sudanese, the Somalis uh, live in dignity, be able to, all of them live in dignity. And that's not possible with unaddressed conflicts. Thank you. Well said. Vonda, please to you. And I would also say that it's not possible if um, other global actors have very strong influence. Um, As we spoke about Russia, um, often being very willing to simply endorse any kind of dictatorship and provide it with Praetorian forces like the Wagner Group to engage in any kind of suppression of opposition. And even China, where there is certainly overlap of interest with the United States uh, in seeing stability and seeing an end to conflict in places like Ethiopia, often believes that this can be accomplished simply by propping up uh, the national government and not really thinking about inclusivity, um, accountability, human rights issues. And as the United States is now navigating, and many other countries, everyone in the world, both people and countries, are navigating the new geopolitics, I would posit it would be a big mistake for the U.S. to fall into the Cold War trap of simply opposing the policies of uh, uh, countries like Russia and China. Rather, we should be driven by our interests, and we should be driven by our values and principles. And that means that even if countries like Russia and China are promoting use the Wagner Group regardless of any kind of humanitarian consequences or human rights consequences, we should not lessen our commitment to stringent conditionality uh, uh, in how we extend our military aid and our economic aid. And ultimately, um, you know, you spoke, Ambassador Feldman, about the need to silence guns to turn to the national reconciliation I I would sort of expand uh, that comment to suggest that there is a need in the horn to move from politics to governance. And that governance will span dealing with some of the very profound issues that um, uh, Your Excellency, you brought up. Uh, Zoonotic diseases, which will be all the more frequent and rampant uh, in the horn. Displacement of people and vast population movements, as we are seeing in Somalia right now, 700,000 people due to climate, due to drought, due to land overuse. If politics continues to dominate day-to-day activity uh, and there is never space for thinking about governance, uh, the humanity uh, that was spoken about will only more be hurting. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. My apologies, I didn't have time to get to all the questions, but I want to thank the audience here and everywhere around the world for joining in, for being part of this discussion. And uh, thank you especially, sir, for your visit and my fellow uh, colleagues at Brookings. So best wishes to you all and signing off from Brookings. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.